Hey, what's up? How's it going? Woo! So there's a chunk of people back there that are doing good. Awesome. Uh, it's so funny. Real quick before I jump, I'm just going to pick up where you left off. You're like a mu magician. I almost called you a musician. You're like a ma musician. You're a magician. You snuck right up on me. Um, real quick, it was, this was funny. I have to share this with you because you're all sitting on the floor and um, I think that's amazing. But this morning I was at the hotel and I was waiting to get picked up and um, there was a group of guys that came down and they looked half asleep. And then one of them got a bright idea. I saw it happen. He said something to his friends and they all went back in the elevator. And then they came down like four minutes later and like all 10 of them were carrying hotel pillows out of the place to come here. <laughs> they all, they, you know who you are too, I saw you. They took the hotel pillows with them because they're like, I'm not sitting on that floor without a pillow. So they took, and the lady at the front desk was just watching all these pillows walk out. She was like, <laughs> thinking those look like our, and then they just left. I thought that was so funny. Come on. Well, I'm going to pick up where Tom left off because uh, I think that he got that, this place on a roll for what we're going for. Um, we'll get to know each other a lot better Saturday night. I'm going to speak, but right now I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, so a little bit about me. I was saved. I got saved in Reading where Tom is now. And I was, uh, are you from Reading or are you just like Reading? You're just excited about everything. I love you guys. Um, but I was, a, I was a drug dealer punk kid. Like, I was the guy out on the streets selling drugs and doing bad things. Had a radical experience with God. I had a face-to-face, heart-to-heart, life-to-life encounter with God on a firefighting bus. I was firefighting and selling drugs. It was an interesting life. Um, and those two things should never mix. And uh, so I was firefighting. I was on a firefighting bus. I was suicidal. I was the life of the party, but I was suicidal. And I was in my own shell just wishing I wasn't alive. And I sat on a fire bus and I asked God one question. I said, God, where the hell have you been? That was my, that was my big question for God. And um, that right there started a six-hour radical encounter where I was, my body was on a fire bus, but my everything else was encountering God. And he was showing me for six hours through my entire life where he had been, everything that happened from good to bad times I felt abandoned, times I, I, I had some of the greatest victories in my life, and he was showing me one after another that he was there. And I sat on a fire bus, a, a young man who was numb to everything, uh, and I cried for the first time in years, and I cried for six hours straight. Like, I ran out of tears, and then somehow filled back up and kept crying. Um, but that was my, the beginning of of a supernatural lifestyle with me. I got saved supernaturally, and so I just from that point on thought the supernatural was a normal part of the Christian life. I hadn't been raised in church to see that, uh, that there's a lot of Christian lives that aren't supernatural. So for me, the supernatural was normal because I thought God's supernatural. I had an encounter with supernatural. I got saved, went to Bethel Redding, and they're supernatural, and the first guy I hung out with, his name was Jason, was supernatural. And uh, I remember the fir one of the first experiences I had, I went to the bowling alley with them. He said, we're going to go to the bowling alley we're going to pray for people. And I said, oh, okay. I'd never prayed for anybody before. I thought, all right, well, let's do that. And so I go to the bowling alley and I'm thinking, what is going to happen here? We're going to pray for people at the bowling alley. And, and, and bowling alley of all places, he picked the bowling alley, I thought. There's a lot of other places I would pick besides the bowling alley. You know, you go in, it's kind of, at the time it was still smoky in there. Like they were still smoking and things. And I was like, okay, we're at the bowling alley. And he tells me this. He said, did you know that God speaks to you? And I said, yeah, he totally does. I got saved that way. I thought, this is normal. God speaks to you. I didn't have to learn how to hear the voice of God. It was just something that happened from day one. And I thought, oh, this, this is what he does. He goes, did you know he speaks to you about other people? And I'm like, well, that makes sense. He said, so God will show you pictures and those pictures about other people and you just go share them. And I'm like, okay. And he, go, he goes, why don't you do that? And so I said, all right. And so I, I just, <laughs> this is my crash course in Christianity. And so I, I, I turned around and I looked at the bowling alley. And with my eyes, I saw a skateboard floating over this guy's head. And I was like, okay. So I went up to him and I said, hey, man, do you skateboard? And, or do you skate? And he, do, do you skateboard? And uh, that just sounded wrong, didn't it? Do you, do you ride a board with wheels on it and skateboard? And uh, he goes, yeah, I skateboard. And I was like, awesome. I came back to Jason. I said, dude, it totally works. 
I got this picture of a skateboard, and I asked that guy, and he said, yeah, I totally skateboard. And then I looked, and I saw this drum set over a guy's head. And I ran over, and I was like, hey, man, hey, hey, hey. He's bowling, and he's like, yeah. And I go, do you play the drums? And he's like, yeah, I play the drums. And I'm like, yes, two for two. And I, <laughs> I walked off, I came back to Jason, and I'm like, dude, two out of two. The guy plays the drums. I didn't, real, I didn't know what, these were, what words of knowledge were for. It, what I was getting was something called a word of knowledge, and that's what Tom just had told you about. But word of knowledge, it's simply God speaking to you for other people. Because God so loved the world. How many of you know that? God so loved the world. And so he wants to use us and empower us. See, Jesus came here to show what a normal Christian life is. Jesus was modeling what your life can look like. This is normal Christianity. If you read Jesus in the Bible, that's normal Christianity. So he came here and he modeled what normal Christianity was. This is what it looks like. Like Tom said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopard, cast out demons. Like this is what you carry inside of you. How many of you know there's a lion living in you and it just wants to get out? The entire Bible is a love story of the father trying to get his kids back. Like it's a story of a father pursuing his kids. And he wants to use us to do it. Jesus came here carrying it, said the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he said the kingdom of God is within you. And then he said go. And he sent the disciples out. And it was their job. And it didn't stop with them. It carries on. And you and I get to carry this same thing. You and I have the kingdom inside of us. And this is the problem. We live in a world where daily we get taught what normal is and how to fit in and how to, how to not make waves and how not to wrinkle the normal fabric of society. And we get taught things like two plus two is four and we get taught all these other things. But how many of you know that the kingdom doesn't fit in normal? Like Jesus came and so guy, men thought normal looks like this. And Jesus came and they're like, he's not fitting what we expected from him. And then he goes to wash someone's feet and they're like, you're not supposed to do that. What are you doing? Get up from there. You can't wash their feet. And Jesus was showing that the kingdom doesn't fit into normal. Like two plus two equals four with us, right? Everybody agree with that? Anybody disagree? Somebody said, no, you did it. No, you raised your hand. It's okay. I don't really agree either, so we're on the same page. Because two plus two with Jesus equals whatever he says it equals right there in the moment. Like you ask Jesus, what's two plus two? He says 387 million. And you're like, no, nah, that doesn't actually work like that, Jesus. Can I, let me explain. Look, two plus two, you put them together and 387 million, what the heck, why? Because he makes it whatever he wants it to be at the time. Because Jesus in the kingdom says what is normal. And for so long we've learned what normal is, but I'm here to tell you there's a different normal. There's a different normal. There's a different normal. It's a powerful, powerful normal. It's the kingdom in you getting out and affecting everything around you. I, I'm, I can feel something in me. I want to jump off the stage right now. Do it. Do it. Do it. That wouldn't be normal. I tore my knee all the way through, and, I, and that wouldn't be normal. If I jumped off the stage and landed and got healed right now, would that be awesome? But if I jumped off the stage and belly flopped, what would that, would that be? Just say, if I do it and I fall, because my, and you just say, more, Lord, more. Let's just act like it was something awesome. <laughs> more, Lord, yes. And I'm, I'm like, ah, and you're like, yeah. So I started off living a supernatural life. And then people tried to tell me what normal was. But can I tell you something? Can we just decide something together? You said yes, you're very trusting. Thank you for that. Can we decide something together? Can we decide that what we've been told is normal is no longer our normal? Can we, be, can we just all agree that what we've been told about fitting into societal norms is not for us? 
Can we just agree that God has called you to lead in the supernatural? That God has called you to disrupt your campus when you go on it? That God has called you to disrupt your generation? That God has called you to go against the norms of your generation where pornography is normal? You disrupt the normal and you show another way because you know deep down in the heart of every single person in your generation they're crying for something that looks different than that? Like, Jesus has fully given us everything we need to disrupt social norms. We were just sharing stories. Tom was just telling me about, I won't tell your story, but disrupting both of his flights on the way here. And I was just like, that is brilliant. (laughs) Totally disrupting the flights. I'm not going to steal your thunder. I won't share it. You do that. I really want to, but I won't. (laughs) Such a good story. So I get saved into this, and I think this is normal. And, and this was the thing. See, I got radically touched by love, and so being radically touched by love, there was something inside of me that wanted everybody else to experience that same love. And my entire Christian life, people have called me an evangelist, and I've fought that word because I thought, I'm not an evangelist. I'm just a son who wants everybody else to feel the same love of sonship because I felt abandoned, and I was suicidal, and when I met God, he showed me he was there, and now I'm lifeicidal, which I think is a, a word now. If it's not, I just made it up. And I love life. I love waking up in the morning. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my life because I met the one who is the giver of life, and it changed everything within me. And so I wanted everybody else to experience that same normal. And I wanted everybody else to experience that same love. So I hung out with people that were doing those things. There's a key to life right there. Hang out with people that are doing the things that you want to do. Hang out with people that are carrying purity. Or at least passionately pursuing it. Hang out with people that are stepping out in the gifts. Hang out with people that want this normal I'm talking about to be their normal. And guess what will happen? It'll cause you, it'll agitate you and irritate you and push you forward to be that thing. And so I started hanging out with people that do this, and this was our normal life. We would go into, I don't know if you have Denny's around here. Do you have Denny's? Okay. It's so funny when you go to a, another country, but Canada isn't really another country, is it? It's just like a line that says it's no longer the U.S., but it's, I mean. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Typical American. I was joking. I know. I know this. I know. I know. I don't even know what I was saying now, now that that happened. I threw myself off there. Denny's. Denny's. We would go into Denny's. I was saved like a month. We would go into Denny's and we'd stand up on the tables and call out words of knowledge. We would just say, God, what do you want to do in this place? God, what do you want to say to the people in here? And he'd say things like, uh, well, someone has a hurt wrist. Um, somebody's got a hurt back. Somebody has scoliosis. Somebody has carpal tunnel. And so we would just go into Denny's and we would practice. Listen to me. It's okay to practice the supernatural. You didn't walk the first time you tried to. You didn't even crawl. You couldn't even roll over. You were stuck on your back at one point in your life and you couldn't do anything other than that. People fed you. People changed your diaper People did things like that. And guess what? Everything that you do in life took practice. Eating took practice. Right? Your little girl putting it behind her, putting it in front of her, flinging it over her shoulder, and every once in a while hits the mouth. Like, that's just how it works. And if it weren't for parents, like, <laughs> we wouldn't make it very far. And so it takes practice. So it takes practice getting the spoon to the mouth. It takes practice walking. And now I, 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 don't, I can't stop walking. I don't know how I thought before. Look at Watch the camera guy. Do you see that? Dude, I was at, uh, <laughs> this guy's good too, because look, every time I flinch, he does. I don't know where you are. There you are. Good job. I can't see you. I was at Jesus Culture in, um, I think it was New York or Chicago or something. There's tons of people, so it was a huge screen. And I totally juked the, I broke the cameraman's ankles. Because <laughs> everything was calm and I was just walking normal. And then I jetted this way and that way and then I went back and I went down like that and he was I was watching the screen and it was like this he was just going back and forth and I was like yes totally lost me let's get back to it so I'd go into Denny's and we'd be with our friends and we would call out these words of knowledge word of knowledge it's it's just God speaking to you let's take all the mysticism off the gifts right now because the Bible says eagerly desire spiritual gifts 
And so people chase after gifts. Long ago, I decided I won't chase after any spiritual gifts. It just got quiet. You go to the toy store, and you see all the toys, and someone tells you you can have any toy in here, one toy, any toy in here. And so you search through, and you find the best toy that you can. And you say, I want that toy right there, and you get that toy. Or you realize that your dad's the toy maker. You realize like your dad owns that toy store. He made every toy in it. And you realize all these toys are already mine. There was an old Long John Silver commercial a while ago. And the, the camera's going down a pier and there's people with fishing poles. Each person has a fishing pole and they're fishing, right? And it's real boring. And then the guy at the end has 50 fishing poles. And it pans to him and he goes, I want it all. And I'm like, that's me right there. You can eagerly desire a gift and chase after a gift. Like, oh, I'm going to be prophetic. So I'm going to chase after prof prophecy. Prof I was going to say pro prophecy. I don't know, even know what I was going to say. I'm going to chase after prophecy, and I try to build my prophetic gift, and I, and I do my prophetic thing, and I'm building this prophetic gift. Or I can realize that prophecy is simply just God speaking to me about the future. Like God's speaking to me about other people, and I can chase after words and knowledge, or I can realize that words and knowledge still are just me having a good conversation with my dad. Like he, let, let's take all the scary off of it. Let's take all the weird off of it and just realize that God speaks to you whether you know it or not. His first language is not English because he predates languages. It's not French. It's not English. It's not Portuguese. It's not Spanish. It's not any of those things. His first language is creativity. He is the creator of it all, so he speaks to us through his language. He speaks to us through who he is. So every once in a while, he'll, use, he'll speak to us by using the little TV screen in our mind. We call it our imagination, right? Here, close your eyes. Everybody. If you can see people around you, your eyes are not closed. <laughs> okay, let's do this. So I want you to picture this. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture with words for you. So it's a huge grass field, and there's a, there's a hill in the distance in this grass field. The grass is about knee high. There's a nice little breeze going through the grass, so you can see the grass moving a little bit. And at the top of the hill in the distance, there's this large tree. It's the only tree that you can see. And there's a rope swing hanging below the tree. A butterfly, it's purple with a little bit of blue around the edges, goes flying right in front of your face. You decide you want to run through the field. So here we go. Ready? We're running through the field. You can feel the grass hitting your legs. You look up at the sky to realize that, bam, you just tripped over a rock. You're good. We're done. You just tripped over your, a rock because you looked up in the sky while you were running. That's what happened. You screamed. She really got hurt. She's like, my ankle. My ankle. I, it was just a picture. It wasn't real. That little TV screen in your mind, as I'm talking to you, you can see what I was saying, right? You're seeing the grass, you're seeing the hill. Every one of us probably had a little bit different picture. Every one of us probably had a little bit different tree. Maybe you didn't even see the butterfly because you're like, why do you even say that? And, 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 you know, and you're running through the grass and each one of us, it was a different picture. But guess what? I was talking to you and I was using your equipment to show you a picture. And it's the same way when God speaks with, now, I don't know that he'll have us trip over rocks, but it's the same way when God speaks to us. He uses your equipment. I think so much of the church is against the gifts because they think that it's got to come from a booming voice from heaven. And that's the only way it's God. And they're like, hello, it's me, God. And you're like, I always thought you'd sound a little different. You sound kind of creepy. And it's not the case. God uses the equipment that he's given you. He uses your five senses. He uses your body. He uses that little imagination, the TV screen in your mind. He uses your ears. And sometimes he, he just bypasses it all and you just have a thought pop in your head that you didn't have before. And so he uses those things. And I've been practicing these things my entire Christian life. And there's nothing wrong with practicing. Practice actually sharpens the skills that you get. And just having conversation with God, having conversation with dad sharpens the skills that you have. And so I could tell you days on end of stories of me stepping out and nothing happening. 
me stepping out and failing, and I could tell you days on end of stories of stepping out and seeing radical things happen. Why? Because you know what? At the end of the day, I don't have a problem with failing because I'm just having a relationship with my dad. And when I have a relationship with my dad, guess what? I'm not the only one that benefits from it. Other people around me benefit from it. I was in a, I was in a Kroger in Georgia. Uh, uh, I never told the Denny story, but whatever. People got healed. It was awesome. <laughs> Stood up on the table and people got healed. But I was in a Kroger in um, Georgia, uh, and I was walking through the store. My wife was uh, getting some things. And um, it, it's a grocery store. And uh, so I'm just walking. I'm pushing the cart like any good husband does. That's my job. I push the cart. Uh, when I don't push the cart, one of my kids always hits me in the back of the heel with it, and it hurts so bad. So I push the cart. It keeps me safe. So I'm pushing the cart through, and my wife's like, uh, she's like ditched me at this point, and uh, I'm in my own world. And as I walk by uh, the butcher counter, my knee, all of a sudden I get a little pinch in my knee. And I'm like, this was pre me uh, doing a backflip and tearing my knee. Um, but I, I was like, oh man, what's up with my knee? And so I walk by, and then my wife goes back to this aisle, so I turn back around and I walk by. And, and right when I walk by the butcher counter again, I get a pinch in my knee. And I'm like, what the heck? And then all of a sudden it hits me. I'm like, God, are you trying to tell me something? And I just feel this peace about it. So I, I look around. Nobody's by me except the guy behind the butcher counter. And I said, hey, man, what's going on? And he says, nothing. What's up with you? You want some meat? And I said, actually, um, when I was walking by, I got this weird pinch in my knee. And I was just wondering, do you happen to have a knee problem? And he goes, how would you know that? I said, like I said, I was walking by, I got this pinch in my knee, and sometimes God speaks to me through little physical sensations when he wants to heal somebody's body. And he said, uh, yeah, actually, there was a drive-by shooting in my neighborhood. I was walking down the road, and these guys came by shooting, not at me, but I ended up getting hit right in the leg, and the bullet lodged in the bone, and uh, they did surgery, and I've had, I, I walk with a limp ever since, and um, I just have lots of pain in this part of my leg. And I said, dude. Let me pray for you right now. It's going to be awesome. And he goes, all right. So he takes off his like, like rubber gown thing or whatever that thing is, apron butchered thing. Takes it off and he comes out. And you can see now when he comes from behind the counter, he's like really limping like this. And so I said, dude, let me pray for you. So we just get my hand on his knee. People are walking by like, what is it? You know, like that's normal. That's normal. That's kingdom normal for people to walk by because all of a sudden you're not doing what is their normal, what you've been taught is normal. And so people are going to look at you weird, but it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. They're just saying, this isn't normal for me. So you don't have to feel weird because it's normal for you, okay? So as they're walking by, I'm praying for this guy. And, and this is the other thing too. I used to always think you had to say the exact perfect words at the perfect time. And it was like this potion, you know, like you said it and then you said in Jesus' name. You always had to say in Jesus' name at the end and it was like, ping, and it would work. And if it didn't work, you said the wrong prayer. I'm like, dang it, what did I say wrong? But that's just not the case. And so this guy, uh, this guy's standing there. I put my hand on his knee and I said, okay, Jesus, you know what you're doing. Uh, you know, <laughs> you don't have to say the exact perfect thing. So I just said, you know what, God, I thank you that you're the healer. And so right now, we just, we just line up with what you're already doing. And so we just tell this need to be healed right now in Jesus' name. And he goes like this, what? What did you just do? And I'm like, I don't know. What did I do? And this is always default. If people freak out, blame it on God. I didn't do it. What do you mean? Did you hear what I said? Jesus, you know what you're doing. And this guy was a lot bigger than me anyway. And so he's like, what did you just do? And I said, I don't know. What, did I, what, what happened? And he said, uh, right when you did that, something changed. Everything just changed in my knee. He's like, all oh, the pain's gone. I said, that's Jesus. He loves you, loves you, loves you like crazy. And that's what he's here for. And so he's rubbing his knee and he starts walking around and he's like, what the heck? What the heck? He's freaking out. He's like, what the heck? You know, he's actually was saying other words. I'm editing. <laughs> and uh, long story short, I, I sit there, we end up praying for him, um, got a word of knowledge about his son. And he said, yeah, my son's an NFL player. Ever since he got in the NFL, he hasn't talked to me. It's been six years. I haven't talked to my son. And I said, well, because I had a word of knowledge about him reuniting with his son. And so he said, that would be great. So we prayed for that. He goes behind the counter, all smiles, tears in his eyes. He's healed, has this whole thing with God. Like he knew God, but he didn't know that God was like living and active. And so now he's like, oh my gosh, God actually loves me, says it out of his mouth. So I walk off I'm, uh, with my wife. We come walking back one more time. And when I walk by now, I'm not at the butcher counter yet, but I'm at the seafood counter. And as I walk by, my back goes, eh. And I don't always get these pains. Sometimes I just get a, a picture. 
Sometimes I just get a feeling. Sometimes I just get a word. This time I like, oh, and I'm like, I am hard headed. So if I can do this, everybody can do this. I'm like, dang it, what's wrong with my back? Even after this just happened with the guy in the knee, I'm like, dang it, man, my body, my poor body. <laughs> and so I'm like feeling my back and I sit there for a minute and I look in the little uh, doorway that goes back in the back where they make all the meat and everything. Um, I know they don't make meat back there, but where they cut it, that would be weird, huh? Like a little bit of this. And, uh, <laughs> Actually, in the U.S., I think they do that. Um, <laughs> it's true. I look back there, and this guy's telling the story to the seafood lady. And he's like, and this is all I see. And I knock on the little window. And he goes, and I said, does anybody have back pain? And this woman comes walking out. She opens the door. She says, honey, I got back pain, and you can pray for me. She just turns around like this. <laughs> I was like, come on. We're having church in Kroger at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's kingdom normal. And so I just said a quick prayer for her, and she's like doing this, bending over. She's like, oh, my Lord, this feels amazing. She's like, she goes around and she starts telling her testimony, his testimony, other people in Kroger. She, gets, she said, I love the Lord. And she starts going around. To, she said, hey, you need to know this. This man's praying for people. And she goes, I got a background. She's just out there talking, and I'm like laughing the whole time. This is kingdom normal. This is kingdom normal. You don't need a PhD in Christianity. You don't need some huge theology degree just to be a son or a daughter. You're a son or a daughter, and your dad is the toy maker. And he's got all the gifts, and he has not held any back from you. And the gifts just come down to simply having a relationship with him. Simple, easy. And it's okay. Listen, before you ever step out, you got an A-plus on the test, okay? So just tell yourself that. Before you ever step out, you got an A-plus on the test. And failure, what we think is failure, is not failure in the kingdom. Just the fact that you stepped out, if nothing happens from that point on, guess what? All of heaven rejoices because you're doing what 99% of the church is too scared to do. You're actually trying. We got to change our relationship with failure and realize that failure is not final and failure doesn't take any worth away from me and failure doesn't take any worth away from Jesus. It's called stepping out. And so you just keep stepping out over and over and over and over again. Thank you. I'm trying. Thanks. <laughs> when I fell in love with my wife, and she was the hot Christian girl that lived across the street after I had an encounter with God. She was the hot Christian. I still call her that. I call her the hotness around the house. The hotness. <sighs> I miss her. Um, it's been a day. <laughs> but when I fell in love with my wife, I knew she was the one. I was, I was just fresh out of being the drug dealer punk kid, got saved, and I thought, I'm going to marry that girl. She lived across the street from me. She invited me to church right as I got home from having an encounter with God. I said, see, I'm going to marry this girl. Went to church, ended up, ended up just like courting or dating her, and I never knew how to do relationships right, but I'm like, this girl, I'm going to learn how to do this right because this girl is awesome. And so we, we, we did the whole courting thing, the whole dating thing, and, and we got married. Listen to me. Have you ever seen young love? I mean, you guys are all young. You know when people like fall in love and it's like nobody else exists in the world? And they're like around each other and you're like, come on. I always tell our young people, like, you better leave some room for Jesus, okay? Because they're all like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, like, like petting each other's hair and stuff. And I'm like, knock it off. Yeah. If you like it, you better put a ring on it, okay? And then we'll talk. <laughs> but they're like, but everybody else fades away. When, when me and my wife got engaged, nobody else existed in that moment. I, I, you could have told me there was 100,000 people around me. You could have told me no one was around me. I wouldn't have known the difference. Why? And my wedding, I don't know who was at my wedding, except I know my wife was there and Chris Valentin was there because he's the one that said, say I do, you say I do. I remember him. I don't remember anybody else at my wedding. I have to look at pictures. Why? Because there was one person at my wedding. That's who I was there for. It was my wife. She walked down the aisle, and I cried like a baby. Listen to me. 
You will do for, I got two minutes to get this point across. We're not going to do activations. I'm going to challenge you with an activation. You're going to leave here with a big activation. You will do for love what you will never do for duty. You will do for love what you'll never do because religion tells you to. You'll do for love what you'll never do because there's rules and right, this is right, this is wrong. You will do for love what you'll never do for any of those things. I will walk through the middle of a huge group of people and scream out, I love this woman, and not even flinch. And my wife will get embarrassed, and then she'll blush, and then she'll give me that look like you just got brownie points, and I'll be like, yes. Because I don't care what anybody else thinks. I care what she thinks. Do you want to walk in power? Do you want to see demons tremble? Like we could tell some stories about demons. That's just, that's just fun. You want to see demons tremble? You want to see the dead raised? You want to see the sick recover? You want to pe- see people's lives get changed? You want to p- see people get saved? Listen to me. The greatest thing you can do is not pursue gifts, but pursue the gift giver and fall in love with the one who loves you. If you can fall in love with the one who loves you, you will do for love what you'll never do for anything else. You will walk on your school campus and go, God has given me the campus. Like you'll just get crazy and you'll get weird and nobody can stop you. And when people try to judge you and when peer pressure feels like it's coming in, guess what? It just falls right off because love is bigger than any of those things. Like you'll stop going to school worried about what people think about your clothes. You know, you're like, are they cool? Are my clothes cool? I think they're cool. I got the clothes that other people got. Are they cool? And you're walking. No, instead you walk into school and you're like, yeah. You know, you just feel good. People are like, what's up with them? They're like, I spent an hour with the big man this morning. He told me my pants look good. He told me that I look good this morning. Nobody else's opinion matters. His opinion matters. You want to change the world? Fall in love with him. And the gifts just start to flow. Why? Because love does something radical to your heart. It says we love him because he first loved us. So he loves us. We start loving him. In that loving relationship, we look in his eyes. We see the reflection of ourselves, and it looks different than we thought we looked. And so we learn how to love ourselves. We learn to see ourselves the way he sees us. And then the natural outflow of that is just what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with everything. And the second commandment is just like that. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we love him with everything. We learn how to love ourselves, and then we turn and we give the love that we have to the people around us. And sometimes it looks like words of knowledge. Sometimes it looks like prophecy. Sometimes it just looks like, hey, I noticed you had a cast on. Can I pray for you? Sometimes it looks like standing up at lunch and preaching the gospel. I could tell you stories of young people standing on a bench in the middle of their whole school at lunchtime and just preaching the gospel because they said, God, what do you want me to do today? And he said, what if you stood up and preached the gospel? And they're like, oh, dear God scared to death, but they stood up and did it, and 85 students followed them out into the parking lot to pray. It's 302. I want you to stand up with me right now. We're going to do this. We're doing Christian, cal- Christian calisthenics this whole time. Stand up, sit down, put a hand on your head, put a hand on your heart, put a hand on your neighbor, put a hand, it's the hokey pokey. It's okay, it's good. Come on. Jesus. <sighs> I, got a, I got this funny little book that God told me to write. It's called Words of Knowledge Made Easy. I didn't bring any with me. And I, didn't, I couldn't work it out. But you can get it on Amazon. It's really easy. So if you want to pursue this, it's a little handbook. It's got 30 days of activations in it. Um, and it's got notes pages and everything. And it'll start you off from hearing God's voice to actively stepping out and getting words of knowledge for complete strangers. So you can do that. But I, it, it, out of, outside of all that and outside of all the teaching and outside of everything that we could try to get you to get right now, if you get one thing from anything I said, it's that heaven is radical and heaven's a toy store and your dad is the toy maker. And if you can just rest in that, and become a son or a daughter who knows that their dad's good and fall in love with him, then when you go on your campus, you go back into your workplace, you go with your family, wherever you're at, the kingdom is in you, and it's wanting to get out. And because you're radically in love, there's nothing that can keep you from letting it out. And so you just, wherever you go, you're unafraid, even if you feel the feelings of, 
there's something in you that's bigger than that, and you go, oh, forget it, and you just step past that feeling. There's a lion inside of you. The kingdom lives in you, and the kingdom changes everything. The kingdom goes against every norm. The kingdom heals the sick, raises the dead, cleanses the leopard, casts out demons. Like God will, God will get you up in the morning and tell you this is what we're going to do today. And it's a life of adventure. If Christianity is boring to you, it's not because God's boring. It's because you're boring. Yeah. Take that one in. I'm telling you, Christianity is jumping out of an airplane. I did it once with a parachute on, but Christianity is jumping out without the air the parachute and going, Jesus, Jesus, and he's like, this is awesome, and you're like, I don't know, and it all, it all works out, I think. I'm still in free fall, so I don't know. It sounds awesome, though. Put it, can you put a hand on your heart? Jesus, I thank you for these sons and daughters. God, I thank you that you are madly in love with every single one of them. There's not one that is left out of that love. God, I thank you that there's no height or depth or spirit or principality or plan of man or scheme of the enemy. There's nothing in heaven or on earth that could ever separate them from the love that you have for them. There's absolutely nothing that can separate them from that love. And God, I ask that you would just, I ask that you would start from the most basic place of love. That their, that their word of knowledge that they get right now, that they would be able to hear you, whether it's felt or seen or known or heard with their ears or heard with their heart, that they would hear you say, I love you. And that would be the starting place, God. And all the gifts would flow from that place where they know that you love them. Jesus got baptized and a dove came down and landed on him. And everyone around him, including Jesus, heard the Father say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I want to say that over you. You are his beloved in whom he is well pleased. And guess what? When, when God said that of Jesus, it was before Jesus had ever performed a miracle. Because God's love wasn't determined by what Jesus could do, but by who he was. God loves you right where you're at, not for what you can do for him, but for who you are. And you could pursue gifts, or you could rest in that love, knowing that he loves you. You are his beloved, in whom he is well pleased. And from that place, we live our lives. And from that place, power flows. And from that place, Purity springs up like a well. And from that place, joy is inside of us. And from that place, peace rests on us. And from that place, we know we got an A plus on the test before we ever took it. This is who you are. You are a son. You are a daughter. You are loved. And he is well pleased. And the gifts flow from that place. So this is my activation for you. I dare every single one of you. I challenge you. I don't know what the word is for your age group. It used to be dare for me, and every time anybody said I dare you, I couldn't back down. So whatever it is for you, I challenge you. What is it? Huh? You're not serious? You're not serious? Okay, so if you say yes to this, I'm going to say you're not serious, and then you have to do it, okay? She told me. This is how it's going to work. So this is the challenge. This is, you're saying yes, okay, I'm going to make it bigger. No, I'm just joking. This is the challenge, and this isn't even that big. I dare you to get 15 words of knowledge before you leave this conference for 15 strangers. Not the people you came with, but other people in here. Words of knowledge can be anything that is past or present. It could be a pain in the body. It could be the fact that they play the drums. It could be the fact that they ride the skateboard. It could be whatever it is. They grew up in a blue house on a gravel road. I don't care what it is. But I want you to rest in love. I want you to hear the voice of your father telling you, you're my beloved. And then from that place, get 15 words of knowledge and actually go and ask the person before you hear, okay? Everybody say yes to that? Yes. Raise your hand if you're saying yes. Everybody look around and make sure their neighbor's raising their hand. There we go. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're not serious. Say it one more time. You're not serious. All right. Awesome. Love you guys. <laughs>